Right now, we have a scripture reading from the Short Family. Our scripture reading this morning is found in Colossians 2, verses 8 through 10. Beware lest anyone cheat you through philosophy and empty deceit. According to the tradition of men, according to the basic principles of the world, and not according to Christ. For in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and you are complete in him, who is the head of all principality and power. Thank you, Carissa. Thank you very much. Pray with me once more. Father, thank you for your word that shines as a light in a dark place. And thank you that that word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory as of your own glory. Father, shine your glory, your love, your light, your spirit, your wisdom and understanding upon our dim comprehension today and let Jesus be seen in clarity. Let your character be seen and understood today. And Father, lead us and guide us in the way that we should go. We thank you for this, the blessing that we have through Jesus. And we thank you that you've heard us this morning in Jesus' name, amen. Our message this morning is entitled, Complete in Him. Because we're going to find uh, from the book of Colossians that Paul told the, the Colossians that you are complete in Christ. You know, we've been studying the, the message to the Laodiceans uh, from Revelation 3. Jesus says, uh, because you say I'm rich, have become wealthy, and have need of nothing, and do not know that you are miserable, poor, wretched, blind, and naked. Therefore, I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire that you may be rich, and white garments that you may be clothed so that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed, and anoint your eyes with eye salve that you may see. Um, as we have studied the ailments that the Laodicean church, this wretchedness is con being convicted of what is right without power to live it. This miserableness that Jesus talks about is being dead in faith, still being dead in our trespasses and sins. This, this poverty that Jesus speaks about is our need of the gospel. We need the gospel to be preached to us until Christ is formed in us. We looked at each of these words and we, we looked back and forth in the New Testament scriptures and we found that this, this is the definition. This blindness, we also found that it is a lack of the fruit of the Spirit, which tells us that we don't have the Spirit to begin with. And this nakedness that Jesus speaks of is with, being without his righteousness, being without him. Um, and as, I have, as we have been studying, as I've been studying this, this message that Jesus gives us to the Laodicean church, this message to his last day church, I've been repeatedly impressed with the same thing over and over. And that is this, that each of these remedies that Jesus offers to his languishing church has Jesus as its center and its core. Each remedy Yes, it's called gold. Yes, it's called the robe of his righteousness. Yes, it's called the ISAP. But it's intrinsically found in Jesus. It is not separate from Christ. You cannot separate these things that we need from him. If you have Jesus, you have these things. And if you don't have Jesus, you don't have these things. Jesus is inseparably bound to the very things that he's offering to the Laodicean church. And this is, this is connected with a testimony that we have from 1 John 5. This is what the Apostle John says. This is the testimony that God has given us, eternal life. And this life is in his Son. 
He who has the Son has life, and he who does not have the Son of God does not have life. And I want to just review some of the things that we've, that we've talked about. Number one, we, we looked at the gold that Jesus offers, and we found that it, the gold represents faith and love. But we learn more than that because we learned that the, goal, the faith and love is Christ's own faith and love. It's not faith and love of someone else or increasing our faith and love. It is Jesus' very own faith and love. We also learned that this faith was refined in the fire. It was refined in the fires and the trials of the cross. Because number one, when Satan was tempting Jesus to abandon the race and save himself, Jesus' love for lost man was put to the uttermost test. And on the cross, Christ's love burned forth brighter. And number two, his faith in his Father was tested beyond measure at the cross. This is why Jesus says, this is the gold refined in the fire. And this faith and this love, Christ's own faith, Christ's own love, he offers it to us. He offers to give us his own perfect divine love and faith in place of the earthly tinsel and mere appearance of human love and faith. And he offers to give us these gifts as we open the door because he says, if any man hears my voice, I'm knocking at the door. If any man hears my voice and opens up to me, I will come in and we will, we will eat together. We will partake together. And with Jesus in the house, with Jesus in our hearts, it will be his love and his faith that is on display in our lives. The remedy that Jesus states is gold, and we know that it's faith and love, but here's the key point. That gold comes only as Jesus comes in himself. You cannot separate that gold refined in the fire of his own faith and his own love from Jesus. Because if you have Jesus, you have his faith and you have his love. If you don't have Jesus, you have just the mere earthly tinsel of faith and love, which is nothing. So Jesus himself is the remedy. Number two, we looked at the white raiment and we discovered that this is Christ's righteousness in two phases, in two parts. It is the perfect faithfulness and selfless life of Jesus lived out in perfect obedience to all the will of his Father. And that perfect record of Christ's life is imputed to us. It's credited to us. It's put to our account. And his perfect faithfulness in every detail takes the place of our sinful, impure, self-destructive record of our past lives. And when God looks upon us, not only does he look upon us as if we never committed a wrong act, as if we have never sinned, but when he looks upon us, he looks upon us as if we have done all the wonderful works of Christ in relieving the downtrodden, in helping the poor, in encouraging sinners in the way. So it's not only the, the life of our sin that he doesn't see, but every good deed that Christ did becomes, comes to our record. And that is called justification. It is imputed. It's credited to us. We studied that. And Christ himself joins his life to our life. And the second phase of Christ's righteousness here is that the very character, Christ's righteous character is created in us through a union with Jesus. It's imparted to us. That word imparted means it's given. The perfect character that Jesus, it's one thing to wipe away the record of someone's past. It's a completely different thing for the transformation of the character of that person. And both are needed God understands that we need both of these to be able to enter into the kingdom of heaven. And this righteousness and character becomes part of our very being. And we are transformed as Christ lives in us. His righteousness becomes our righteousness. And this is what the Bible says. Notice this, um, 2 Corinthians 5.21. God made Christ 
who knew no sin to become sin for us so that we might become the righteousness of God. But where? In who? In Jesus. This righteousness of God is inseparably connected to Jesus. And if we have Jesus, we have that righteousness. And if we don't have Jesus, we don't have that righteousness. So, again, this this, both of the gifts of imparted and imputed righteousness of Christ, um, it does not come independent of Christ. It is a divine attribute, and that attribute becomes ours as we receive Jesus into the life. In other words, you can't get Christ's robe without getting Christ. It comes together. Same with the gold. You can't have the gold of divine faith and love without Jesus. And number three, the ISAV. We learned uh, a few weeks as we've been studying the ISAV that the ISAV is spiritual discernment. And it is spiritual discernment brought to us by the gift and the presence of the Holy Spirit in the life. Now the Bible says that the Spirit only comes into the lives of of those who accept Jesus by faith. The Holy Spirit does not manifest himself to the whole world. He comes into the life of those that invite him in, of those that seek God, of those who believe in the one that God sent. And this is good news, because I'll tell you, Satan has no respect for us. Satan will kick down the door of our lives, force himself into the life, and demon possess all who are not sheltered in Christ. But the Holy Spirit only comes. You know, right in this passage in Revelation chapter 3, Jesus is depicted as, behold, I stand at the door and knock. If it's Satan at the door, he has a battering ram and a whole army of demons who are wanting to press themselves into our lives. Jesus stands at the door and knocks. It is only by invitation that he will come in. But that also means that we need to be asking him on a daily basis to come in and make his home in our hearts. Jesus said this, John 7, 38, He who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. And the next verse explains to us that those rivers of living water, he spoke of the Spirit. So what is the condition that Jesus says here? We must believe in Christ. That's the first condition. The second condition is that we must ask. Those of you who have the 40 Days of Prayer book by Dennis Smith and have been going through that book, you know that Dennis Smith reminds us that unless we seek, unless we knock, unless we ask on a daily basis, and he gives many quotations from the Bible and the spirit of prophecy that affirm this, unless we're daily asking and seeking and knocking for the gift of the Holy Spirit, we're we're left empty. The Holy Spirit may knock, but if we say, I don't have time to study my Bible this morning, I've got an appointment that's coming, you know, my daughter's screaming in the next room, I have to do this, I have to do that. If we don't take the time to hear the still small voice of the Spirit knocking at the door of our hearts, and we push it aside and we say, I'll deal with it later, Satan will make sure that later never comes. And we learn that the Spirit's work, now this is the Spirit's work for the world, He comes into the life of the believer. But his Spirit's work, the Spirit's work for the world is to convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. He convicts the world of sin by convicting us of our lost state. When you do wrong, when we do wrong and we feel guilty and ashamed, this is not God trying to give us a a, a bad self-image. God is saying, he's warning us. The way that you're going seems like the good way, but its end is the way of death. That's his warning. And and the Spirit also convicts us of righteousness, and that the righteous, the only righteous one is Jesus. He is man's only intercessor. 
And because he's seated at the right hand of the Father, he, we know that he is the only one approved by God to deliver and save the human race. And he, so yes, the Spirit convicts us of sin, but then he points us, he says, look there. There, up, up to the cross where Jesus died, and look up still higher to where Jesus ministers at the very right hand of God. There is your righteousness. There is your salvation. And last week, we also looked at this, that the Holy Spirit convicts the world of judgment. At the cross, we found out that the government of this world and the ruler of this world were both judged. The principles of this world were judged and justly condemned because the sins of the whole world were laid upon Jesus and then those sins were condemned to death. Jesus took all that you and I have done upon himself and he says, willingly, I will lay down my life for the sheep. And those sins were justly condemned at the cross so that God could justify the sinner. Also, love and righteousness and selflessness were fully vindicated at the cross. And now the whole world has a chance to choose. Will I serve the government of Satan? Or, even, even barring that, will I just serve myself and do what I want to do? When we make that choice, we automatically place ourselves on the side of Satan because he was the first one to say, just do what you want to do. Don't listen to God. Don't worry about keeping his commands. You have enough wisdom and intelligence to chart your own course. When we decide to do that, we're already in his camp. That's why Jesus says, you know what? Um, if they don't believe in me, they're condemned already. In John chapter 3, verse uh, 17 and 18. The eye salve comes to us to show us the difference between the government of Satan and the government of God. The eye salve comes to us so that we can see sin clearly for what it is and abhor it and find it disgusting and say, God, I don't ever want to do that again. I don't want to be this person that I have become. I reject that and I cling to my Savior. I ask Jesus, give me the role of your righteousness. Give me the eye salve of the Spirit so that I can live your life. Give me the gold of faith and love in the heart. And these gifts... The eye salve of the Holy Spirit comes in when Jesus comes in. It does not come to us apart from Jesus. Every one of these remedies, the gold, the white raiment, the eye salve, number one, they all point us back to our Savior and the cross. And number two, they tell us that these are not gifts to be dropped off in a basket at the door. They only come. They're inextricably bound to the person of Jesus himself. And if you have Jesus, then you have the gold, and you have the white raiment, and you have the eye salve. But if you don't have Jesus, you don't have any of those things. And again, I point us back to this verse in 1 John 5. This is the testimony. God has given us eternal life, and this life is in his son Jesus. Because he who has the Son has life, and he who does not have the Son does not have life. We're going to take a little look this morning at the book of Colossians. The book of Colossians um, was also, we're going to find out, needed by the Laodiceans. The counsel to the, book of, to the people in Colossae, Paul says, when you read this letter, be sure and send this letter to the Laodiceans. They need it too. So we're going to look at the counsel that God, that God through Paul gives to the Colossians because it's counsel for Laodiceans. The Colossians had received Jesus as their Lord and Savior by faith. They had been forgiven and cleansed of the sins they had committed in the past. And they had received Jesus into the life and the heart. The indwelling power of the Spirit was in them and working among them. Among other things, the book of Colossians is a reminder to the Colossians and the Laodiceans both that Christ is their glory and their all in all. Let me share with you 
Notice this verse from Colossians 4.16. Now, when this epistle is read among you, see that it is read also in the church of the Laodiceans, and that you you likewise read the epistle from Laodicea. Even though we're not certain if we have the, the, some people say the Ephesians is the epistle to the Laodiceans, and it very well could be, because it does contain some of the same things. But even if it isn't, we have the epistle to the Colossians, and we know that what was written to the Colossians is the very thing that the Laodiceans needed to read. So that's why we're looking at this this morning. I don't have these scriptures on the, on the screen. Open your Bibles to Colossians chapter 1. If you're at home, go, go grab a Bible. You, we're we're going to need it. We're going to take a look at quite a, 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 the first two chapters here of Colossians. So grab a Bible. You'll need it. Colossians chapter 1 um, and verses 1 through 12. And as we go through this, it's, it's beautiful because we're going to see that the, the Colossians had the gold. They had the white raiment and they had the eye salve. But Paul was warning them because there were other things that were being paraded before them and they were being told that you need this in addition to what you already have. We're going to start here, Colossians chapter 1, verse 1. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, to the saints and the faithful brethren, notice what he says, in Christ. In other words, They had received Christ, and Christ was in them, and they were in Christ. To the faithful brethren in Christ, who are in Colossae, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, Romans chapter 5 and Romans chapter 8 tell us that it's when we receive Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior that we have peace with God. The Colossians had received Jesus. And by the merits of Jesus' righteousness, by the white robe placed over them, they had peace with God. This is how we know that the Colossians had the robe of Christ's righteousness. Number, two, number verse 3, we give thanks to the God our Father, of, to, the, to, uh, to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you, since we have heard of your faith in Jesus Christ and of your love for all the saints. Did you notice that? We've been praying for you ever since we heard of your faith and your love. Did the Colossians have the gold of Jesus, the gold of his faith and love? Yes, they did. So we've been praying for you ever since we heard of your faith in Jesus Christ and of your love for all the saints. Because of the hope which is laid up for you in heaven, of which you have heard before in the word of the truth of the gospel, which has come to you as it has also come in all the world, and is bringing forth fruit. Were the Colossians destitute and not bringing forth fruit? No, they also had the ISAV of the Spirit. They were bringing forth fruit. They were not desolate. They were not um, destitute. So it is bringing forth fruit, and it is, it is also, as it is also among you, since the day that you heard and knew the grace of God in truth, as you also learned from Epaphras, our dear fellow servant, who is a faithful minister of Christ in your behalf, who also declared to us your love in the Spirit. Do the Colossians have the eyes have of the Spirit? No question. They have the robe of Christ's righteousness. They've received Jesus as Lord and Savior. They have the gold, of this, the gold of his faith and love. And they have the presence of the Spirit that is bringing to fruitfulness all the, the, uh, the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, long-suffering, patience, kindness, self-control, gentleness, all of these gifts, all, all of, those aren't gifts, all of these fruits are found in them. Verse 9, for this reason, we also, since the day that we heard it, do not cease to pray for you and to ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. Now, this is amazing. This is beautiful because this tells me that even though the Colossians may not have completely understood all the will of God, even though they may not have been full to the brim with wisdom and spiritual understanding, They had Jesus. And because they had Jesus, they had the gold, they had the white raiment, and they had the eye salve. And Paul was simply praying 
that God would continue to open their eyes to the full extent of God's will. This is good news for us because, you know what, I'll tell you, one of the fears that I had when I became a pastor was that one day someone would ask me something and I wouldn't know the answer. How many times have we been fearful to give a Bible study because we're afraid that someone's going to ask us something that we don't know the answer to? You know what? It's happened to me many times. But you know what? If we have the Spirit of Christ, if we have Jesus, we have all that we need to be able to share Jesus with them. We may not have the full understanding of God's perfect and complete will. We may not have all spiritual discernment in every matter. But if we have Jesus, we have enough. And we're complete in him. So he continues praying that you may be filled with this knowledge, the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding, and that you may walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing him and being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God, strengthened with all might according to his glorious power. This is what we need. This is what Laodicea needs. This is what we need. Verse 12, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. So he tells them what they've already learned. Jesus is everything. Jesus is enough. Jesus is first, middle, and last. Jesus is the Alpha and the Omega. He is the author of our faith and the finisher of our faith. And if we have Jesus, we have salvation. We have salvation in him. Notice what Paul does, spends the next 10 verses telling them. He's going to talk about one thing, and it's Jesus. Verse 13, God has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of the Son of His love. He's speaking about Jesus. In whom, Jesus, we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. Again, he's exalting Jesus. Verse 16, for by him all things were created that are in heaven or on earth, whether visible or invisible. Even Satan was created by Jesus. That's the point that Paul is making. Verse 17, he is before all things, and in him all things hold together and exist and consist. He is the head and of the body, which is the church. He's the firstborn from the dead. He has the preeminence. For it pleased the Father that in him all the fullness of the Godhead should dwell bodily. This is essentially what he's saying. For it pleased the Father that in him all the fullness should dwell. And that by Jesus to reconcile all things to God the Father whether things on earth or things in heaven and to make peace by the blood of his cross and you who were once alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, he has now reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and blameless and above reproach in his sight. What Paul is doing is he's saying, Colossians, Laodiceans, if you have Jesus, you have all you need. If you have Jesus, you have everything. Jesus is all and in all. He is the beginning of the creation of God. He is the one that was raised from the dead. He is the author of your salvation. He is the one by his Holy Spirit. He comes to dwell and be in you. He gives you grace and strength and power. He is everything. He is all you need. But the Colossians and the Laodiceans were buffeted by many ideas, especially from uh, those that follow the law of Moses, especially from the Jews, because they were told by this other group that, yes, all right, believe in Jesus. Some of them would even go that far. Believe in Jesus for your salvation, but you have to be circumcised. Believe in Jesus for your salvation, but you have to keep the law of Moses. Believe in Jesus for your salvation, but you have to keep the Passover like a good Jew. Believe in Christ for your salvation, but also keep the traditions of the elders, the traditions of men. 
Believe in Jesus for your salvation, but you have to do good works. You have to do those good works. And Paul, Paul is reminding the Colossians, he said, look, you already have Jesus. You have everything you need if you have Jesus. Now I know that that statement or that, that slogan has at times been commandeered by others who do not understand its full significance. But if we have Jesus to the fullest, as it is our privilege to have Jesus, then we certainly do have all that we need. Notice how Paul ends this chapter, verse 26. The mystery that has been hidden from ages and from generations, has, but has now been revealed to his saints. To them, God will to make known what are the riches of the glory of this mystery, even among the Gentiles. And what is this mystery? What is this mystery that had been hidden from ages past? What is this mystery of the gospel that brings salvation? It is Christ in you the hope of glory. If you have Christ on the inside, you have a place in heaven. If you do not have Christ on the inside, if you only have the trappings of Christ, if you only go to church on the right day, and you don't eat pork, and you are a good vegan, and you are trying, like a good Laodicean, trying to keep the commandments of God in your own strength, you are going to come up short because if you don't have Christ, you don't have life. And this is why the Laodicean church needed to read this epistle. Because the Colossians were hearing all of these things that their Jewish brethren were telling them and they were starting, yes, all right, I have to keep the law of Moses. Yes, I need to keep the feast. Yes, I need to cling to Jesus and I need to have my good works. It doesn't work that way. If you have Christ, you have all that you need. And I will say this. If you think you have Christ, and your life is not in harmony with him or his commandments, then you better check again. Because Christ is not a minister of sin. Christ, the Holy Spirit, when he comes into the life, he actually transforms, remodels, renews, creates a new heart and a new life. And you may have come down to the altar and said, I choose Jesus, I accept him in my life. But if your life hasn't been radically transformed and changed, you don't really have Jesus. You may be in a walk with Jesus. Jesus may be drawing on your heart. He may be working with you. But if the day were to end today was the last day, and you only had a desire for the kingdom of God and a desire to be right with God and you had not fully surrendered your life and fully allowed Jesus to come into every aspect of your life, then Jesus will say, depart from me, you who work iniquity, I never knew you. You didn't have me dwelling in the heart. I stood, I knocked, I pleaded. My spirit said, let go of this, Edward. Yield this to me. Follow me all the way. Hear my words and obey. But you would not. Depart from me, you workers of iniquity. And God does not want to say those words to any of his people. Notice Ellen White's comments on this. There is not a point that needs to be dwelt upon more earnestly, repeated more frequently, or established more firmly in the minds of all than the impossibility of fallen man meriting anything by his own best good works. Salvation is through faith in Jesus Christ alone. Christ has given me words to speak. You must be born again or else you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, all who have the right understanding of this matter should put away their controversial spirit and seek the Lord with all their hearts. And then they will find Christ and give a distinctive character to their religious experience. You know what? We as good Laodiceans, as good Pharisees, sometimes go about trying to pick the fruit off ourselves and off of each other. 
We try and go about and tell them, well, you, you, you need diet reform, and you need dress reform, and you need to do this, and you need to do that, and it's all about the externals. And Paul is reminding the Colossians and the Laodiceans, if you have Christ, you have everything you need. If you truly and fully have him, Listen, when that man hanging on the cross at the, at the side of Jesus accepted Jesus into his heart, his name was written in the book of life. But he was still hanging on a cross for what he had committed and done. Externally, his life hadn't changed a single iota. Externally, somebody might have looked at him and said, hey, we don't want that guy in the church. And there are people that may be coming to us that may have externals that are not in harmony with all that we know about Jesus. This is why Paul at the beginning of the letter is praying, may you come to the full, if you have Jesus, you have everything you need. And may you come to the full knowledge and wisdom and spiritual discernment of the knowledge of God. And may you learn to walk worthy so you can be an absolute wretched sinner and accept Jesus into the life and heart. And that is it. That is what you need. And Jesus is going to take care of those other things. He's going to teach you. But don't be deceived, Laodiceans. Don't be deceived, Pharisees. If all of your externals line up and you don't have Jesus, you don't have life. So the inevitable question becomes, do we really have Jesus Christ? living in the heart. Can we know? Can we know that we have the Holy Spirit? The Bible says yes. Let me share with you a couple of passages. Romans 8, verses 16 and 17. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. Paul says you can know that you are children of God. You can know because the Holy Spirit, when he comes into the life, he bears witness with your spirit and tells you, you are Christ's. But if you have any doubt, if you wonder if you are really Christ's or not, then I would venture to say that you are not Christ's. I don't say this to discourage anyone because there's many times that I've asked myself that question and I've had to come to the conclusion I am outside of Christ right now. God speaks this to us because he does not want us to be destroyed. It's not a comfortable question to sit with yourself and ask, do I really have Christ? Or do I just have the trappings of Christ? But God brings this question home to the heart he brings this question home to each one of us because he wants us to have life. He wants us to say yes to his son. And if we have the son, we have life. Notice another verse, 1 John chapter 3, 24. The apostle John puts it this way. Now he who keeps his commandments abides in him. In other words, that means he has the Holy Spirit in him and he's abiding in Jesus. The result is that he keeps his commandments and he is in him. And by this we know that he abides in us by the spirit whom he has given us. In other words, what he's saying is for Jesus to abide in you means that the spirit of God is dwelling in you. And if Jesus is abiding with you, guess what? You're going to be keeping his commandments. This is why we can say with certainty, when my life is out of harmony with the spirit of, this, of the law, when I run my mouth off at my wife and I am upset or express bitterness or resentment or, or I have evil thoughts and I don't reject them immediately or, or whatever I may do, I can be sure. I can be sure that I don't have the spirit of Christ dwelling in me. Now, brothers and sisters, we are not cast off and rejected if we fall in a moment. The Spirit of God continues to pursue us. He continues to woo us. He continues to call us back to Him. But at the end of the day, if we've committed sin, what we need to do? Jesus, this is what I did. 
Father, this is what I've done. Forgive me. Wash me afresh in the blood of the Lamb. Give me the sweet gift of your Holy Spirit. Create in me, like David prayed, create in me a clean heart and restore your right spirit within me. This is the prayer that the sinner needs to make. But have no misgivings about it. When we are outside of God's law, the Holy Spirit is not dwelling in us because he is a Holy Spirit and Christ is not a minister of sin. Notice Ellen White's words. This is from the book Steps to Christ, which by the way, I'm going to be starting a series on Steps to Christ, probably not in the way that we have thought before. In other words, so next week, I'm going to take chapter one of Steps to Christ and read it and then bring out the essential elements of it. I'm not going to, I'll probably read from some quotes in the book, but I'm not going to go through step by step and everything. I'm going to bring out some stories and some other lessons that teach the same thing. But if you want a double blessing, read Steps to Christ. Read one chapter for each week for the next 13 weeks. And then we will come together on Sabbath morning and study the essential core teachings of that chapter because we want Jesus on the inside. We want him to come into the life. But notice what Ellen White says. This is from Steps to Christ. She says this, this is what we have to do every single day. Consecrate yourself to God in the morning. Make this your very first work. Let your prayer be, take me, O Lord, as holy and completely thine. I lay all my plans at your feet. Use me today in your service. Here's the invitation. Abide in me and let all of my work be worked out in you. You see what she, this is what she's saying. She's invite the Holy Spirit. Number one, humble your plans. Consecrate yourself as holy the Lord's. Lay every plan, lay everything that you want to do today. Now, there are times when I have problems praying this prayer because I have evil plans for the day. There are things that I know that I want to do that I don't feel free by the Spirit of God to say, that tells me, go do that. You know what you can do in that case? You can say, God, here's this, here's this evil desire in me. I know that I need you today. Take it from me. Give me your thoughts. Give me your words. Give me better thoughts than these. Give me your plans. Come and take all of my life, all of my plans, all of me, and abide in me and let all my work be worked out in you. Because we have no work of our own. Nothing that man can do will ever merit anything. It is only as Christ comes in and works and lives in us that our work is worth anything. And then it's not our work. Whose is it? It's his. So she says this, by the way, if you're asking, sitting here asking yourself, am I Christ? Do I have his spirit? The question I have for you is, did you invite the Holy Spirit in this morning? Because if you didn't invite him in this morning, as we said before, he does not crash down your door and demand entrance. That is the work of another spirit. So the invitation, have you set an empty chair, an empty place setting at the table of your heart for your Savior? That's the question. If you can answer that question, I can answer whether the Holy Spirit is in you today or not. This is a daily matter. Each morning, consecrate yourself to God for that day. Surrender all your plans to Him to be carried out or given up as His providence shall indicate. And thus, day by day, you may be giving your life into the hands of God and thus your life will be molded more and more after the life of Christ. A life in Christ is a life of restfulness. How many of us need that? Two weeks ago, I was having a horrible week. I didn't have any peace. I was agitated. I was upset for almost five days out of, the, out of that week, maybe more. I didn't have any peace. I was upset. I was angry. I was frustrated. I couldn't get my way. Not good. But when, 
There's no joy in that. There's no rest in that. There's no peace in that. But a life in Christ is a life of restfulness. This is what we all need. There may be no ecstasy of feeling, but there should be an abiding, peaceful trust because your hope is not in yourself. It is in Christ. Your weakness is united to his strength. Your ignorance is united to his wisdom. Your frailty is united to his enduring might. And you are not to look to yourself. You are not to let the mind dwell upon self, but dwell upon Christ. Look at Christ and let your mind dwell upon his love, upon the beauty, the perfection of his character, Christ in his self-denial, Christ in his humiliation, Christ in his purity and holiness, Christ in his matchless love. This is the subject for the soul's contemplation, and it is by loving him, copying him, depending wholly upon him, that you are to be transformed into his likeness. I want to share a song with you. You probably know this song, but in light of the message that um, we've shared this morning, it felt like it had a special place in this message. There we go. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly trust in Jesus' name. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly trust in Jesus' name. When darkness seems to hide his face, I'll rest on his unchanging grace. And in every high and stormy gale, my anchor holds within the veil. Christ alone, cornerstone, weak made strong in the Savior's love through the storm. He is Lord, Lord of all. When he shall come with trumpet sounds, oh, may I then in him be found, dressed in his righteousness alone. Faultless to stand before the throne. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your incredible love to us. We thank you for the message of warning that Jesus sent to his church, to us, to his people. Father, we confess that even though we can't see all the ways in which we are just as Jesus has said that we believe them, we are poor, wretched, miserable, blind, and naked. 
And many of us, Father, have not had the gift of your spirit. We have not had the covering robe of Christ's righteousness. And our discernment has been blinded. But Father, I thank you that Jesus, you have sent Jesus. And in Jesus, we have every perfect gift because Jesus has become for us wisdom and salvation and righteousness and redemption. And when he comes into the heart, when we hear him knocking, and he's knocking at all of our heart's doors right now, we can say yes. And we can know that he comes in. We can say yes, Jesus, forgive me of my sins. Forgive me of my past failures. Give me a new heart. Restore righteousness into my life and my mind and my heart. Put your right spirit, uphold me by your generous spirit, Father. Give me a new heart and a new a new outlook and let Jesus come in. And with Paul, we can say that I die daily and the life that I now live, I live through faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Father, we need the mystery of the gospel, this Christ in you, the hope of glory. We need this. Your church is languishing, Father. We are, we are full of self and selfishness and we confess that to you. Let Jesus come in, Father, and let us have that peace and that joy. Let us have um, the restfulness that your servant talks about, Father. No matter what may be going on in the world around us, no matter what may be, what, how the enemy may be assaulting us individually, whether we have a job or whether we don't have a job, whether things are going rosy for us or whether they're going miserable for us, that if we have Christ, we have life. And if we have Christ, you will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you. Father, we thank you that you have emptied all of heaven to give us these gifts. Help us receive them. Help us on a daily basis, Father. Say, yes, heavenly guest, make your home in my heart today. All of my plans, even the evil ones, Father, uproot. And give me Christ. Father, bless your people today. Come into our lives and live out your will. In the name of Jesus, we ask all these things. Amen.